Well, as Breyer mentioned, Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus was at Al Shifa Hospital today. And the IDF released a six minute unedited video of Conricus showing what he says the Israeli military has discovered in this hospital. Here is a montage of that video edited for brevity. Security cameras have been obstructed. All of the security cameras are uh, covered. There is a, an AK-47. There are cartridges, am ammo. Uh, there are uh, grenades in here, of course, uniformed. And all of that, this was hidden very conveniently, secretly behind the MRI machine. When our troops open this uh, closet here, which is in the main part of the clinic, this is what they found. These weapons have absolutely no business being inside a hospital. A live grenade, ammunition, fighting vest with insignia, boots and of course uniforms, and last but not least, standard AK-47. Tactical radio communications, which we will analyze. Lots of disks, which will be analyzed. And a computer, which at first glance already provides a lot of incriminating for more on the situation at Gaza's largest hospital, I'm joined by Lieutenant Colonel Amnon Scheffler in Tel Aviv. He is a spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces. Lieutenant Colonel, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We've just shown some of the footage of your colleague, uh, Jonathan Conricus, who was at Al Shifa Hospital today. Uh, it shows taped over security cameras, uh, some bags of weapons, some military gear, a laptop, radio, some compact discs. Is this the extent of what was found at the hospital by the IDF today? This is a, a substantial uh, information that is being uh, found inside. And this is, of course, based on the intelligence that we had before and also that our counterparts, including the U.S., have affirmed independently. Um, and we also know that for weeks we have been calling for civilians and patients to leave the hospital because it is being used by Hamas, deliberately used uh, by Hamas. So we also know that they had the time to evacuate different equipment uh, from there. Okay, but uh, when, when uh, your, your intelligence services a few weeks ago released an animated video showing uh, Al Shifa being used as a command center, they showed subterranean tunnels and subterranean uh, uh, command centers. Has anything like that been uncovered uh, by your forces since they, they took control of the, the facility? So first, uh, we are acting in a very specific part of uh, the hospital with a, a very uh, trained force. Uh, that is entered into a specific part of the hospital in order not to uh, harm, of course, any civilians and patients uh, that are in the area and to minimize any kind of friction that uh, could be. So we are still operating in a small part of uh, that hospital and we're acting still there now, looking for more terrorists and more activity that is done and that was done in that facility. So it is the plan to, to find this subterranean command center and these tunnels uh, while the IDF is, is in Al Shifa right now? Will the operation be expanded to see that? Because I think that's what most people were expecting uh, to be shown as proof that this was in fact a command center. The MO of uh, Hamas as a terrorist organization is to deliberately embed itself in the most populated areas. And these are schools, uh, these are kindergartens and mosques, and also hospitals, like we saw in the Vantisi Hospital, like we saw in the Al Quds Hospital, and like we're seeing also here in the Shifa Hospital. And with our goal of this uh, war is to dismantle Hamas, we are going after them wherever they are. Um, and in, this includes into the hospital where we know that they have been acting and carrying out terrorist activity from within it. Right, but I, but I guess I, I'm wondering if you say right now the operation is in a very specific part of the hospital, the MRI facility, I believe, is what it is. Will it go into these other areas where you've put out photos and, and, and reconstructions, video reconstructions, showing where the tunnels are and, and the subterranean command centers are? Is like, will, will we see actual evidence of that beyond the animated video? We're acting there operationally, and we're also collecting uh, the evidence. And once uh, we have that, we will share it uh, with everyone to see, like uh, we have done. We have uh, been very open, of course, uh, to the press uh, to join us uh, coming into these uh, uh, areas that are under continuous uh, fire and fighting um, in order to show to the world really how Hamas operates and uh, what they have done. I remind everyone that Hamas has also done this by themselves on October 7th they came in with GoPros on themselves and wanted to air that to the world, the massacre that they carried out. Um, so 
we are also uh, going to expose how they are using these installations to carry out their terrorist activity. I wonder if you can give us a, so a sense of the, the fighting presence Hamas had at al-Shifa. I, I know the press release or the statements from the IDF says that you killed, in your words, a number of terrorists. How, how many fighters were there? How many are still there? Uh, how, how many were killed? Can you give us some precision on that? So fighting in the vicinity of the hospital has been happening uh, continuously and also yesterday before entering uh, the hospital. Um, and it's uh, continuously happening also in the areas. Um, and uh, um, I can't say specifically how many um, uh, terrorists were killed in, in that engagement, uh, but th throughout the whole fighting, dozens of terrorists have been killed in that vicinity. In that vicinity. What about inside the facility itself? Was there any firefight inside the Al Shifa compound? No, there wasn't? No fighting was inside uh, the compound, although we did find, as uh, mentioned, uh, military equipment, uh, including the AK 47s and uniform that were left behind. So I don't know how they left uh, the area, but we can guess. Okay, so what is your expectation? You say operations are continuing there. I wonder how much longer do you think? Uh, it will happen inside the hospital. Will the hospital be allowed to return operation? Or now that the IDF is in there, do you intend to stay? Because if this is a command and control center, I can't imagine you would want to cede it back. What are, what are the immediate plans for this facility and your forces? So we have two very clear goals for uh, our operations. One is to dismantle Hamas, and two, to bring, out, to bring back the 239 hostages that have been held for 40 days in Gaza. In regards to the hospital, we're doing everything in order to allow it and to uh, give the patients the best care that uh, we can. We have brought today incubators uh, to assist with that. We have brought fuel uh, to the hospital, uh, putting our own soldiers in risk when bringing that fuel to the hospital. We have allowed and called for the eastern part of the hospital to be used as a humanitarian exit, uh, continuously talking to the directors of uh, the hospital. And we've also invited any international organization and countries that wish to help with uh, putting up Hosp field hospitals in the southern part of Gaza, where for many, many days we have called the civilians and the innocent people to move to that area so that they can get any treatment and any humanitarian assistance that they need. But there, there are still military strikes in the southern part of Gaza, right? We spoke to a Palestinian Canadian woman whose family is in southern Gaza, and, and, and 14 of them were, were killed by a missile strike in the last couple of days. She's now lost more than 100 people in her extended family in Gaza. And, and I know you say you've given them weeks to get out of al-Shifa and other hospitals, but there's no surplus hospital capacity anywhere in Gaza. So, so where do they go if, if there's still military strikes against the south and there's no hospitals with space and, and, and supplies are scarce? The south is the safer area because we have started from the main headquarters and the main area that uh, Hamas operates, which is the Gaza city. And we know that Hamas, as I mentioned before, deliberately positions itself in the most populated areas. And that is why Hamas also operates from the south. They don't limit themselves to the city of Gaza where military conflict can happen. They are shooting rockets. At this moment, we are over 10,000 rockets that have been fired from the Gaza Strip, including from the south part of the Gaza Strip at Israeli civilians. And as I mentioned, we are there, of course, to stop Hamas from continuous terrorist activity, wherever that is. Yet, we are limiting our uh, operations in the southern area, and we're trying to do everything that we can, including today refueling UNRWA cars and letting in uh, over 100 trucks to assist in the southern part. Um, and, and that's what we'll continue doing, um, but uh, going after Hamas wherever they are. Yeah, I'm certainly not suggesting Hamas has stopped. I, I know they continue to fire, and their leadership has been on television saying they'll do October 7th again and again and again. So uh, like, certainly I, I'm not trying to suggest uh, they, they are not uh, uh, persisting in, in their aggression. Uh, but the, the civilian toll is causing some consternation. Certainly here in Canada just yesterday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau urged Israel, in his words, to exercise maximum restraint. He says the price of justice for October 7th can't be the continued suffering of all Palestinians. I, I wonder what your response is to comments like that from Western countries like Canada. I respect very much what uh, Prime Minister Trudeau said and agree pretty much with everything he said, and that's what we're doing. We are trying to mitigate in the best ways 
the way to counter uh, Hamas and uh, uh, stop them from ever being able to carry out another attack like October 7th. And also, we know how Hamas operates. They are using the civilians of Gaza as their human shields. And this is the cost of that kind of battle. And sadly, we don't want to see any life lost, not Israelis, not Palestinians, and not anyone else. Uh, and that is why we're fighting this fight, in order to never see these kind of pictures and these kind of horrifics happen again. I understand what you're saying there, that Hamas is using human shields, and I think that's widely accepted. This is a tactic that they do use. Uh, but Israel still makes the choice, right? And I know all the concepts of the laws of war and proportionality are all taken into consideration. But for people who don't live in that world, they're seeing a, a civilian death toll that is rising, and you're seeing dead kids, you're seeing dead women, and it's just they see a tragedy that's spiraling, and, and, and people are calling for a ceasefire uh, increasingly. I mean, how do you feel the world is going to react to the mounting death toll as a result of, of your military operations, regardless of what Hamas is doing? Uh, people want this conflict to pause, if not end entirely. We want it also to end, but we need it to end in a way that we can return to safety and know that this will never happen again. And this is the challenge, but that is why we are going after it and we have to meet the goals that we have set in order to be sure that the massacre of October 7th will never happen again. And we're also sure that after we do this, not only that Israelis will be safer, but also Palestinians within the Gaza Strip will be safer without Hamas being there. Lieutenant Colonel Amnon Scheffler with the Israel Defense Forces, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you for having us. Israeli military carried out a raid on Gaza's largest hospital overnight. It claims to have found weapons and equipment that proves Hamas ha was operating out of the compl complex. But the attack is drawing condemnation. Israel's military incursion into Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City is totally unacceptable. Hospitals are not battlegrounds. We are extremely worried for the safety of staff and patients. Protecting them is paramount. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is calling for Israel to exercise, quote, maximum restraint. And today, a new poll out of the U.S. shows that American support for Israel's military operation is eroding. Here to walk us through all of this is Aaron David Miller. He is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and previously served as a U.S. State Department official working on Middle East policy and the Arab-Israel peace process. Aaron David Miller, it's good to see you again. David, thanks for having me. There's quite a bit to discuss there, uh, but let, let's start with Israel's move on Al-Shifa Hospital. What do you make of their decision to go in there and, and the evidence that they sort of put on the table for the world to see today? I think it was an, it's an inevitable and inexorable result of the campaign, or at least the war campaign objectives that the Israelis have. I think October 7 created a whole new frame of reference for the Israelis. Uh, and by implication, given the fact that the U.S. has been quite supportive for the United States as well. I think the indiscriminate nature, the sadistic intimacy of the killing uh, has created a, a much broader margin in Israel's own mind for what it has to do in Gaza. And that includes the torturously complicated problem of prosecuting a war in a densely populated uh, area, roughly the size, twice the size of the District of Columbia, 21,000 humans per square mile. Uh, these hospitals, mosques, residential areas clearly have been areas where Hamas has embedded its military assets for any number of reasons. And I think the, uh, the, um, what the Israelis have described as a precise attack, and let's be clear, we're really in the dark in terms yeah. of the granularity of, of Israel's war operations in Gaza. They control the information space. Uh, and I think that's, um, part, you know, part of the problem in trying to evaluate exactly what it is they're trying to do and what they're claiming. The stuff that they've released from their Antisi Children's Hospital clearly indicates that Hamas was using that as a facility to store military equipment and perhaps even to stash hostages. And U.S. intelligence uh, over the last 48 hours at least confirmed uh, Israeli suspicions with regard to Shiva Hospital. So again, they're losing the international battle. But right now, I think uh, <clears throat> the one constituency that they're uh, that they have to keep in their corner 
uh, is the United States. And so far, uh, that's been the case. So, so, but on that point, with, with what they showed us from El Shifa today, and I know they say they're only in one area of a vast complex, but, you know, as, as they built the case to go in there in the weeks leading up to this, they showed a computer-generated map showing subterranean tunnels and command centers and all of these things. Today, we got about a dozen machine guns, some grenades, uh, you know, it... it I don't want to minimize what they found, because clearly it means Hamas in some form was in there. But do you think that was enough to justify what they've done here over the objections of the international uh, community in a lot of ways? It may not be. And I think it's really up to the Israelis to demonstrate that in terms of proportionality, mm. um, that in fact that was a, a compelling uh, a target and produced the evidence to suggest that, uh, that it was. So uh, it's obviously caused some political fallout in the United States and definitely here. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said yesterday he wanted Israel to exercise maximum restraint, and he's gotten some criticism for mentioning the killing of women and children and babies, domestic criticism for that, but also from Prime Minister Netanyahu, the main opposition leader in Israel. They've all criticized Justin Trudeau. What do you make of that? What did you make of the Prime Minister's comments and the reaction from the Israeli uh, political set? I mean, the Israelis have fallen back on their talking points, which is essentially is that you want to assign responsibility for the civilian deaths when you talk to Hamas. Uh, they're the ones who are making our job excruciatingly difficult and painful. And look, I think the Israelis, frankly, uh, have lost a good deal of the international legitimacy that is presumably critical to sustaining their military operations. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the one partner, ally, um, friend that state of Israel cannot afford to alienate is the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And so far, the administration's position has been, uh, we understand what the Israelis are trying to do in the wake of October 7. And frankly, and this is a source of our reduced leverage, I think, we have no better answers. We have no better answers for the Israelis on how you actually prosecute a war where in fact you're dealing with densely populated civilian areas. We have no better answers for the Israelis as to how to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza from the South where the Egyptians and Hamas are also part of the problem. And frankly, we have no better answers uh, on what uh, to do about the proverbial day after. I think American leverage would be much, much more, much tougher, frankly. And perhaps if we were willing to deploy it, if we, in fact, had better answers to all of these questions. The reality is we don't. The international community wants a ceasefire. My only question would be, what is the purpose of the ceasefire? That answer is critically important to the logic of trying to uh, move toward one. What is the purpose of the ceasefire? Cessation of hostilities in place? Toward what end? Yes, you can surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza. But for how long? And I, I think really that un until the United States separates from Israel on the broader objective of the campaign, which is, and again, what the metrics are for Victor here, I don't know. How to ensure that whatever happens in Gaza in the post-conflict period, you don't have an organization like Hamas that is in a position to do what they did on October 7th. That is driving Israel, Israel's logic and I suspect it's fairly compelling also to the administration, regardless of its isolation, the administration's isolation, in the, uh, in the Arab world and in the region. There's going to be a deal on hostages. And the deal is going to provide four, five, six, seven days of quiet for the release of, I don't know how many, uh, probably women and children in exchange for uh, <clears throat> women and uh, young men, or adolescents, I'm assuming, uh, that are imprisoned in Israeli jails. The question then is, what is the next step here? Right. What exactly? What is the end? What is, what is the end game here? And that nobody has an answer for, other than the Israelis. And that's obviously an answer that most of the international community in the region doesn't accept. You raise a lot of very big questions and correctly point out that there are no good answers or no better answers to them. And, and you, uh, you say that the, the Biden administration's support has held. That is certainly true, though we are seeing some polling from the United States. 
showing public opinion is maybe sliding over the way Israel is conducting this, that the demands for a ceasefire are growing. And then there's the longer-term challenge that you wrote about in, in foreign policy, saying that Biden now owns the Israel-Palestine conflict. What do you think this means uh, for Joe Biden? What, what must he do now in, in the time we have left? You know, if the president of the United States, <clears throat> in the middle of an incredibly dynamic situation, basically says, we cannot return to the status quo that existed before October 6th, the galactic nature, the sort of cosmic significance of that statement is extraordinary. Because if, if, in fact, there is no return to October 6, here's what that means. It means Hamas does not operate in Gaza as a military organization. It means there needs to be a transitional mechanism of good governance to demonstrate real security. Mm -hmm. And it means if the administration is interested in getting Palestinian involvement, and they must, who else is going to govern Gaza? The international community? We'll see how many takers there are for uh, representatives of, of Canada, Britain, France, the United States, to basically dispatch troops in what ultimately could be, and I suspect will be over time, a Hamas resurgence. There's going to there's going to be a counterinsurgency over time in Gaza, is my is my read. So um, he, the president has taken that on. And he's also taken on the reality that if you want Palestinian, incredible Palestinian actor involved in Gaza, you're going to have to tether Gaza. Gaza first can't be Gaza only. Right. And what that means essentially is a serious, credible effort to pursue a diplomatic end. I mean, it's incredible that <clears throat> when I hear myself say it, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or at least set the stage for something that ordinary humans, David, like you and me, right. would regard as serious. That's what the president has apparently committed himself to. And he's going to be doing this in 2024, engaged in a very close election with the presumptive Republican nominee at a time when he's managing uh, Ukraine, worried about a rising China. Mm. It, it really is head exploding, the degree to, to what he is signed up for. And it really requires a lot of imagination to believe that these two communities, deeply traumatized, uh, both by the events of October 7 and by the Israeli war, war campaign in Gaza, right. are going to be able to produce the kind of leaders on each side that are, will be required to make the historic decisions to end the conflict. Okay. It's pretty extraordinary. Aaron David Miller, uh, Senior Fellow at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We always appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today. David, thanks for having me.